Good morning, and today we're going to talk about my kind of street photography and the cameras we use. But before we start, while I'm thinking about this, while I'm out walking, I remember once, I can't remember where it was, I was just come off stage giving a talk to quite a large audience about my style of street photography, what I do, showing them some images, showing them how I use cameras, etc. And I don't know, you know, let's, let's call it 800 people in the audience. And I came off a stage and people asked questions and this guy came up to me and he said, um, why don't you be a man and hold your camera to your eye and take people's photograph like that? What shocked me was I'd just done two 45 minute talks on exactly why I don't do that and exactly why my street photography style is the way it is. And also, I just stood on stage in front of 800 people. I don't have a problem with going up to someone and putting a camera in their face. It's just not my style of street photography. We all have our own styles. We all have the way we, own way we use a camera. And whatever works for someone works for someone, as long as they can produce the goods. I don't think I've ever met anyone yet that's criticized my work online or to my face, which is pretty rare. But I don't think I've met anyone yet that's criticised my work, that can actually show me their work, any of their work at all, anywhere. I don't think I've actually seen anyone's work that ever criticises a lot of people. The biggest trolls online, you don't see their work. You can't find their work. There's no links to their work. They haven't got any bloody work because actually they're shit. They can't take any photographs. I don't like using that word shit for people that do into photography because I believe Anyone should be able to pick up a camera and go and take photographs and enjoy it and shoot their style of photography any way they want. But I don't think they've got the right when they haven't got a body of work and they haven't got a clue what they're doing to criticise other people, especially come to pay to come to see someone talk and then come up to them afterwards just to try and put them down. We all shoot in different ways. I shoot three different ways, actually. There may be a few more. Um, when you look at... Uh, the people of the past, like Cartier Bress and Vivian Mayer, and I'm going to go on to all Jenny and Witt, everyone. I'm not going to go through a whole list of brilliant street photographers, but Vivian Mayer used to look down into a ground glass viewfinder. So she never actually really stood there looking at the subjects eye, at eye level. And that's why some of her work is amazing candids and even her self-portraits are so good. Because she's not looking where you think she's looking. And if you look at a lot of my work, you think I'm holding a camera to my eye and taking the photograph, and then you think someone's staring me back. They're not, because most of my work's taken at waist level as well, because it's where I prefer the camera to be. So it really, really is about personal choice. And you don't want to all be the same. If you actually go on a landscape photography course, everyone's got their tripod at the same height, all in a row in the same place. They're all getting the same picture, just two foot to the left or two foot to the right of the person that's just taken another one. What's the point in that? So the whole point of using a camera is to be completely different. So I'm going to talk today about my style. It may not suit you. And I'm also going to talk to you how my style's changed since my stroke and how I've just had to get another camera because of the way it's changed. And so, yes, you have now got an excuse to go out and buy more camera gear if you need to change your style. So then, let's get into this. That's better. Back in the warm. I can talk to you properly now. So... I suppose I better start with the history of cameras and I'm not going to go into deep into the history of cameras but if you look back in the history of cameras um, I watched a whole program once day on, on cinematography and the man that invented moving film and everything else and it's quite a sad story and times change when cameras first came out you know we had these wooden cameras with wooden legs and plate cameras and all the other types of different chemistry that was used to create and make photographs. We're way beyond that. But in the process, even I, as a child, when I started out at whatever, seven, eight years old, um, I started off with 35 millimeter film, 120 film in a roll camera, this, that and the other. You couldn't even see the image before you'd taken it. I remember going out one night because I wanted to learn how to do long exposures and you know at the end of the day it's trial and error and I'd go out and stand by the side of a road to catch light trails 
and shoot 36 rolls of completely black film because I've under or, or completely white out film because I've under or overexposed so badly. I don't know what I'm getting. So the whole process of learning to use the film and the cameras and develop and process was a very, very intricate process. And as, a, as an eight year old or even younger, the whole process of learning to develop and print and everything else was a huge process of photography. And you learn so much about f-stops, the exposure triangle and everything else about an older style camera. It's unbelievable. And before that, it was mostly about the chemistry because the lenses were crap. And it wasn't a long time before they developed great lenses for cameras. So cameras have changed over the years and we've adapted and changed with them. It's basically easy now. A lot of people think you can just go and buy a camera and use it out of the box. Yes, you can, but you can't take great photographs with it. The camera takes a great photograph. If you point it somewhere nine times out of 10, it will focus and take a photograph. What it's of, who knows? It could be something completely ambiguous like a brick wall, a tree, this, that and the other. So the camera could get it right. The camera could expose properly, focus properly, get a nice photograph of a part of a tree. But there's a lot more to it than that. There's a lot more about composition and everything else, which isn't part of this video. Today is just about cameras and how cameras change and for a little bit about how that's affected by photography. Our camera needs change and our cameras change. I said a little bit earlier on about Vivian May. It used to go out with a roller cord, a roller flex camera, ground glass screen in the top, hold it down like this, look down inside, compose and take the photograph. Perfect. For her, she didn't have to look at her subject. She just looked down in the ground glass finder. You'll see some photographs where she took some selfies, where she's holding the camera like this and she's actually looking, in theory, at the camera. How can she do that? Because she's already looked seen, composed, and then looked up and then pressed the shutter. The work was all done here. Ironically, that's a possibility that she did that, but the way I work, which I'll come on to at the end of this video, is no different to that. My whole process is almost the same, but with a modern style camera. Now, I'm gonna come on to that towards the end of how I work and why it's the very much the same as Vivian Mayer at the end. So I'm going to talk a little bit of cameras and first and photography. The first thing to look at is this. And people say this, but it is, is and isn't important. People say the camera doesn't matter. And to a huge extent, it doesn't. And I think a lot of that comes by people can just get a camera and call themselves a photographer and they're not a photographer. They're just a camera owner that takes pictures. There's a lot of difference about taking a great picture and photography and art and everything else and it's too expensive for just one short video. I will explain this. The art world basically works by how well, you know, how well known you are, how popular you are, how popular your art is, how your work stacks up with someone else that's actually selling at a, a really high rate. So let's put it this way. If you're having an exhibition with someone that's selling their paintings for a million pounds and above and you're exhibiting with them in a gallery, the chances are people are gonna wonder, oh, this person's work must be really, really good because it's in a gallery next to this person's. So by exhibiting with different people of different fame and different qualities, it brings your work up. Now I'm not gonna say because you're exhibiting your work as an artist with a million pound photographer, you're gonna sell yours for a million pound, but people are gonna start getting interested in your work. It's as simple as that. So photography exhibitions and art exhibitions is how you get really known in the pho real photography world and the art world. And people do look at your work online. They do appreciate your work online. They look at your Flickr, your Instagram, your website, and they look at it. It's not the same as unless you've been in an exhibition or you've had your work printed. We did an exhibition in Paternoster Square in London. Uh, Linda Wisdom, Paul Saunders, myself, I think it was Robert Bentley, and um, Christian Cross. Within the first hour, someone came up and bought a print from Paul Saunders, uh, a, a landscape photographer. I think it was 300 pounds. So he walked up, he saw this print. He thought it would work really, really well in his front room. He bought the print, 300 quid. Guess what he didn't say? What camera did you take this with? He was not interested at all 
in Paul as a photographer or artist, he actually just liked the work and thought it would fit in his front room. One of my first ever photographs that I sold was sold to a guy that liked the name of what I'd called the photograph because it put a sense of place of where I'd taken it. He didn't ask me anything else. He loved the photograph. It would fit in his front room and the name was relevant and the place it was taken to some of his family. So he bought a photograph off me. Didn't even want to know what the camera was. So you've got to be aware of that. Photography exhibitions are important to me. And I've been involved with a lot. Alan Raw from Hull and other people around the country have enabled and helped me get into exhibitions. I've helped friends get into exhibitions because I think it's important and it elevates your work. But before you're in an exhibition, you've got to have a body of work. Now I've exhibited with Paul Saunders, Brian Griffin, Marilyn Stafford, John Ballmer, Tom Studdard, uh, Peter Dench, uh, loads of different photographers. And one of the things I get out of it is I look at their work and I look at how they've put their exhibition together and curated it. And it makes you really want to strive to do better and do more. Obviously, this all came to a bit of an end for me when I had my stroke and it sort of finished my exhibition days, possibly, but maybe I'll come back to it, I don't really know. But it's who you exact exhibition with and when you're walking around an exhibition and when you're taking all the exhibition in, and if anyone's been to one of mine, you'll actually understand that. Um, when you go to an exhibition, you look around, you're looking at people's work, you're looking at their body of work, how they're doing, what they've done before maybe, the work that's with them, the other people's work, how is it compared with this person's work, how is it compared with that person's work, is it any good? Now I'm not going to tell you who this is but I walked in an exhibition one day and I thought knowing about this photographer, this photographer was really great. I looked at his work and I found it completely lacking in any skill in photography at all and I actually wondered how it even got to the level he had. The, the, the horizons were all wonky, the, the buildings weren't straight. It was an absolute disaster. And when you actually look, you think, blimey, this person is known as, you know, this sort of level in photography. And there's something I'm missing. I don't know what it was, or maybe I'm not. Maybe it's a bit Emperor's New Clothes. I don't really know. So what you've got to look at is no one's interested, even me on that day, when I was looking at this person's work, I wasn't thinking, what camera did he take that with? I was thinking, actually tell a lie, I did think that. I think this was probably taken such a long time ago, he probably didn't have levels in his camera and everything else to actually realise it was all wonky. But um, he should have been able to understand that. It's one of the most basic things I learned when my uncle taught me, which I'll come on to that story. I've probably told it in one of my other videos, but um, my uncle taught me all about horizons and levels and everything else and the way the brain works. And if you can't see that, what else can't you see? But I'll come on to that at a later date. It's not really one for this video. My style of street photography has evolved over the years with my cameras. And when I started out, I started using film cameras and I, was t I photographed people and landscapes. And most of the photographs I took of people with, with a camera held to my eye, and I used to do portraits and stuff, the biggest problem I ever found was my camera affected the way people interacted with me. When you go back years and years and years to the years of Carter Bresson and everyone else, the way people interacted with photographers was different back then. Some people ignored some and some people played up to them. In this day and age, everyone's used to cameras and people react in a different way. People are a bit strange these days. People think cameras are aggressive. Considering the fact they're filmed probably everywhere they walk in this country, people seem to have a real big problem with having their photograph taken. But the, the, my style of photography is all about photographing people without changing the dynamic in the scene. In other words, yes, in some of my work, if you go and look over onto Instagram, some people appear to be looking at me. Some people do actually look at me. But most of the time, my ideal shot is looking, seeing a scene evolving, changing and about to happen and capturing that moment as if they didn't know I was there. And I have evolved a style to do that and I'm having to evolve a style to do that again. My style has also changed because of the projects I've done. My reflection project, my litter project even, uh, my selfie reflection project, my windows project. It's all a bit about shops and windows here. My coffee shop project but I've done lots of other projects before these even came about. 
And a long time ago, I did a colours project, and people are doing these sort of projects these days when they first do photography with smoke trails and all these things. I did all those when I was eight, nine years old. So when I talk about stuff, I'm talking about stuff that I've done over the last few years and stuff that I may want to do in the future. But so my photography has changed and evolved, and so have cameras, and that's the most important thing to remember. Still photography is very interesting and unique. I've done video as well. And it's very interesting, when you shoot video, or you make video, or you make films, you have to collaborate. You have to collaborate with artists, you've got to collaborate with the performers that are in the videos, you've got to collaborate with the sound people that are involved in the video, you've got to collaborate with makeup artists, you've, you've got to collaborate with all these people to make a video and make a video work. As a still photographer, you're quite lonely and you do it all on your own, which creates another problem. It's a really bitchy, bitchy, bitchy industry. I call it ancestrally small industry, the photography industry. And social media has made it so much worse. If you go online, people are proper nasty online. And that can actually be nasty exhibitions and they can actually be nasty for no real reason, except they're no good at what they do or they do not understand it, which is done in Kruger effect, which I've talked about before, which I'll talk about again in another video because it's still relevant as today as when I talked about it before. You've got to ignore all the camera chit chat and crap about cameras and this camera's best for this and this camera's best from that from people that do not know what they're talking about. At the end of the day, the street photography, some people say it's bad about all the bitchiness and nastiness, but the street photography side isn't as bad as the wildlife side and the landscape side, trust me, because there's more people doing that than there is on street photography. Street photography's got more popular over the years and trust me, it's as bitchy as hell. I think I got put on a list once of the fourth, I come out fourth or fifth best street photographer in the world or something or another. I don't even know how, because as I say, I think my work's crap. But at the end of the day, I got put on this list. The people that were slating the list, and I just thought it's just a list. It doesn't matter. It doesn't mean anything to me as it does for the people that voted for me to be on this list. I don't know who voted for me to be on the list. I don't even care. I'm just gonna carry on doing what I'm doing and shooting violence. But it was the nastiness of the people saying, how did he get on there? Who cares? It doesn't bother me. I think it's funny. I found it more interesting looking at the people that were getting upset about it than anything else because most of the people that got upset about it, I couldn't find any of their work. We go back to that same old thing again. These people that moan and groan and sulk and bitch, they haven't got any work, they don't take any photographs. It's a bit like art and artistry. These people that say, oh, he's a shit artist, he's a shit artist, at the end of the day, how do they know? I can't see any of their paintings, I can't see any of their drawings, I can't see any of their sketches. It's just ridiculous. We cannot have these people deciding what we do and say. And I know this is about cameras as such, but it's really about photography and the cameras we use for it and why that's important. At the end of the day, no one really, unless you get really, 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 really into art, no one buys a painting for their wall at home and thinks, I wonder what brushes they used. I wonder what turps they washed their brushes out in. I wonder what they did with this and I wonder what they did with that. They don't think that. Only people at the top of their game and probably the artists themselves think, oh, look at the way those brushworks move. Look at the way that palette knife's been used. Look at the way that's been done. I wonder what pigments he uses. You've got to be up there at the top of your game in the photography game or the art game to start looking at stuff like that. At amateur level or even just starting out in photography and everything else, getting the camera that works for you is the most important thing. One of the things that does happen in this day and age is social media is good for getting your work out there, but it's really, really, really bad for knobs and idiots to start causing you shit and problems online and also slagging you off and upsetting people and everything else. I've got loads of stories to tell about that. But at the end of the day, one of the other things that isn't helping is brands. Now, someone can use clever algorithms to build themselves up a really, really big 300,000 uh, follower Instagram account. If you look at their photography and their work, it's very, very average or sometimes very, very poor. What they've done is they've gamed the algorithms to get themselves 300,000 followers and then the brands find them and think, oh, they'll be really good for us to help us shift boxes. Because at the end of the day, you've got to remember, brands really are all about shifting boxes. Fujifilm are a little bit different, but I'll come on to that. But they are really about shifting volumes of boxes. And the more volumes of boxes they can shift, the happy they are. So they're happy to take on all these ambassadors that have got loads of following just to get their products out there. 
But what you've got to remember is if you look at some of the work that's on there, it's absolutely rubbish. And some of the brands do a really, really good job of getting these people. I, I'm not going to mention who does what, but some just give these people cameras and say, off you go. Do you know what I mean? They go and take a few photographs and keep them, got themselves a nice camera and that's it. At the end of the day, the brands are not helping at all whatsoever. In fact, I was looking at a brand years ago and they asked me to look at their camera, I took it out for the day, took some photographs of it. It was absolutely junk for street photography. And I told them that, and they basically didn't want, to, didn't want to talk to me, this, that, and the other, but I don't care. I've used, I've had other brands come to me and say, can you try this out for street photography? I go out and I try it out and go, it's no good. Oh, thanks very much. Can we have your feedback? Now they're the ones that are worth working with because they want to know and they want to learn. It is getting more and more difficult these days because you know, I'm filming this on my iPhone and my, I use my iPhone a lot. And at the end of the day, the iPhone or your phone or your, your phone camera, your smartphone, takes away a lot of the camera market. It's that diminished certain sections of it. So the people like Fuji and everything else seem to be concentrating on, con concentrating on their GFX and bringing out more GFX stuff and GFX lenses, this, that, that, because it's, you know, top of the game, top camera brand, this, that, and the other, blah, blah, blah. But I have to go back and remember why I actually moved to Fujifilm. And the reason I moved to Fujifilm, which I'm going to come on at the end of this, as I say, is the camera, the smallest camera they made. The funny thing is, the smallest camera they made, the X100, when it first came out, it was a very difficult camera to use. And one of the main reasons it was a difficult camera to use, not so much for myself, is because when it first came out, it produced absolutely fantastic black and white images and colour. I still believe to this day, the, X1, the original X100, one of the best camera sensors in any camera. The problem is the autofocus system wasn't very, very good. The camera is very slow and hard to use, but it was like using a film camera again. The exposure triangles on the outside, you have to dial in what you want. You have to think about what you're doing. It slowed you down. It made you think. You couldn't just run around the street going click, 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 click. You couldn't do that. You had to put a lot of thought into the whole process of using the camera. And the first thing that happened was, it was professional photographers with great, I had a Nikon D3S at the time, and I changed to an X100. Sounds completely crazy, but it just worked so perfectly for me. <laughs> Using the X100, first of all, I had to zone focus, I had to think about what I was doing, I had to compose the image, and I had to shoot the image very, very slowly. If I rushed into it, the camera wouldn't do the job I wanted it to do. So I had to adapt to the camera. In adapting to the camera, my work got better. As my work got better, I sold more, I got noticed by different people and brands, and my photography elevated itself. Why? I don't really know the formula at the time, but it was like a, a full stop in my photography. Basically, by changing the camera and changing the way I worked, it elevated my work, which helped me learn and helped me move forward. It was an absolutely brilliant move to make. Not many people made it at the time and they all started falling in love with these type of cameras later on. Most of the people that got an X100 100, returned it and said these things are shit. I don't know how people can use them. I bought one off eBay once, but just because I wanted it. And I took some photographs with it when I got it. And the guy who I bought it off, daughter, found my work online and he emailed me and said his daughter had said, why didn't this camera take photographs like that when you had it? It's a very, very poignant thing to say. We both had a laugh about it, but it's got nothing to do with the camera. Nowadays, you can pick up an X100 probably for about five, 600 quid, and they're probably still one of the best cameras Fujifilm have ever made, but you'll get it. You'll get it out of the box. You think, I don't like this menu system. I don't like the way it works. And you'll probably hate it, but if you took the time to learn how to use it, you probably think, Wow, this is absolutely brilliant. So, I'm not saying go back to an X100, but you have to find a camera that works for your style and your budget and the way you do things. Now, whether that's a second-hand one from MPB, a one-off um, eBay, something like that, or a top-of-the-range camera. I know people that have got the money to go out and buy a brand spanking new GFX and use it for street photography. And if they want to do that, go and do it. I wouldn't have said it's the perfect camera to use for street photography, and I don't know what you're gonna do with those great big huge images. And once you start getting into the realms of getting into medium format and then file sizes, oh, it just goes on and on and on. You need a great big processing system, you need a computer, you need somewhere to store it, blah, blah, blah. 
you're better off with just 12 megapixels on a on an older style camera and get out there and really really enjoy it so it's really about finding a camera that works for you and once you've found that camera that works for you just remember this i can go out tomorrow and buy a set of chisels i can go out tomorrow and buy a set of tools i can go out tomorrow and buy a set of frying pans the frying pan is not going to make me a chef, the tools are not going to make me a mechanic, and the chisels are not going to make me a carpenter. I now have to learn. And the biggest process of all this, if you change it and mix it around, is it's not easy. It's not easy to just pick up a chisel and jump on a lathe, unless you want to take chisel stuck out the top of your head. And it's not easy to suddenly get a set of tools and take a car apart and put it back together again. You have to go and learn. The same as art. I'm doing art at the moment, which I'm coming into in some later videos. I'm learning all about papers. I'm learning all about paints. I'm learning all about pens. I'm learning all about different pigments in paints, different paper grades. Diff oh, it's just a minefield. I did all this at school and I'm having to relearn it. I'm starting to sketch trees and this and the other. My trees are crap. Um, I've shown you a few and I'll show you some more on my Instagram. I'll, I'm, I'll show you some more at some point in time on, on YouTube. Uh, yesterday I put some photographs on at the end of my video, I didn't like them, so I've changed my camera settings to actually shoot 16x9 and hopefully when I actually take some photographs in the future they'll fit. I could muck about and make them all fit and everything else in the videos, as I say I haven't got the will to edit. Editing this with the amount of times I've stopped during it is bad enough without having to do all that. So you have to learn and as I say Go and pick up any camera and learn to use it. And learning to use it doesn't mean getting out of the box, go, oh, this is really difficult. I can't photograph with this. I can't do this. Leave it, forget it. You have to go out over and over and over and over and over and over again and learn to use it. But it may not fit with the way you work and your style. And that's really, really important. Once you've actually learned to use the camera and you've decided what style, and this is about street photography. So, you know, you know, if you're going to go and do landscape, you have to go and study from the masters of landscape. If you're going to go and be an artist, you study from the, the masters of art in the past. Go to um, galleries and look at the art on the walls. If you go to a really, really good art gallery and you look at the art on the walls, you see the way the artists have painted the light in, they've painted the shadows in, they've painted this in, they've painted that in, they've highlighted faces. They've spent hours creating this amazing, amazing picture and so do photographers. So if you're going to do street photography, Decide on the style of street photography you want to do. Study the masters at that. Emulate them maybe first of all, and then find your own style that works for you. I've had many people say, don't be shooting windows like Matt Hart when they teach street photography courses. Well, they can take pictures of windows if they want, they can do what they want. I've learned one thing over teaching the thousands of people I've taught over the years in photography. They can stand next to you and copy you because they see you take a photograph. Their picture isn't quite the same as yours. It may not be in focus. But once they've left you and they've gone away, they hardly ever do what you're doing. Even if you show them how to exactly process an image, they can't repeat it over and over again like you do because it's a, fa a feeling you have and the way you see it and the way you work is personal to you. So if you create your own style and your own way and you study this person and that person and you pick up a little piece from this person, a little piece from that person, as I said earlier, making film is all about collaboration. If you go and sit in a coffee shop and you talk to other street photographers, you're not going to steal all their ideas and their work. It happens sometimes. I've sat in coffee shops before and I've talked about a project I'm doing and then four or five people are copying the project. That's up to them. It's my project. I started it. What they don't realise is what I'm learning from it and what that will lead on to in the future. And most of the um, projects I've done turn into exhibitions or they did do in the past. And most of the people that have copied me have taken three or four images, stuck it on social media, and you never see it again. Whereas I'm working towards an exhibition. So I may have shot, you know, a couple of hundred images that year, and then 12, 24, I'll end up in an exhibition. I'm shooting for a completely different reason to everybody else. And that's really, really important. So what do I use at the moment? The truth is, for my travel and landscapes, I just use my iPhone. I've got an iPhone phone 12 pro max and i shall skip this year's iteration which is the 15 and i should probably get next year's i always leave it two years it works for me i've got through length three lenses on that work for me it edits it does all i want to do i can print a4 to uh, a4 slightly bigger than a4 if i want to um it works for me i can put them on instagram i can put them on my blog i can put them on here if i want to um it works for me and they're only for me um i've I've had a GFX, I've had loads of different cameras, 
I've taken all different types of styles of photography. I've printed everything else. At 60 years old, all I want to do now is go for a walk and take photographs of my iPhone. Why my phone's pretty much waterproof. It fits in my pocket. I don't have to carry a bag on my back with anything in it. It really is just the easiest thing for me. When I look back at what I did, used to do for landscape, I, used to, I got through three or four different um, tripod styles because back in the day of keeping everything still and steady and moving sort of fine adjustments, I wanted an actual adjustable tripod head, a ball and tilt head wouldn't cut it because you put the camera on and it falls to one side and this, that and the other. So you spend hours and hours and hours learning how to use a camera and take landscape photographs. And then technology, going back to cameras, Technology changes, it changes over time. You don't even need a tripod for a lot of stuff these days. It all can be done in camera. It's amazing what you can do with a camera just walking around. Yes, if you wanna do long exposures, etc. Funny thing is, I can do long exposures in my iPhone better than I used to do some long exposures on my Nikon D3S, whatever it is, 10 years ago. It's amazing how camera technology has moved on. It's amazing what your phone can do. And the snobbery around it all is just ridiculous. Yes, there's probably times in the past where I've said, oh, a phone, but phones weren't good back in the days of Nokia. If you took a photograph on it, it was a bit of a hit and a hope. These days with an iPhone or a Samsung, I've got a Samsung, I don't know anything about it. But a lot of the phones these days are absolutely brilliant. I was looking at someone's the other day and the zoom on it is absolutely amazing. I don't know what you can see with it. You can see through windows in skyscrapers like miles away. They are absolutely stunning bits of kit. Anyway, moving on to what I use now. So I, Still have an X100F, it works for me, it works brilliantly for me, or it did do until I had my stroke. One of the things I was talking about with Vivian Mayer is, when she looked down in a ground glass viewfinder to look into the top of the camera, she can see what she's shooting and she's not making eye contact. So what is she doing? She's looking at the ground glass finder, she's framing and composing the image and she's taking a photograph. What I do with the next 100, I'm not gonna stand up for the sake of this video. I put the strap around my neck, I get it to a place where it feels comfortable on my body. Obviously it's a lot lower down than this video. And I know where that is. Now I did do before my stroke. Because what you've got to think is, if you hold a camera to your eye every day of the week and you take a photograph like this, when you're composing and moving the camera fast to get a photograph, you have to start seeing and being a bit of a predictor of the future sort of thing in street photography. You've got to think, if that's going to happen and that's going to happen, what's going to happen next? Is those two people going to come together for a kiss? Is that person going to do a cartwheel or a somersault? Is that person going to look out of that window? And you've got to think, right, that's going to happen. And you've got to bring the camera up to your eye. Most of the time when you're bringing the camera up to your eye, you may shoot before you get it to your eye. If you watch some of the old masters shoot, they've probably gone click, 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 put it to the eye, properly framed and composed, click again. Because otherwise they wouldn't have got the shot. Now the funny thing is, in the process of bringing that camera up to your eye, you're keeping the camera level and straight, you've already get in there, get it to your eye, you go click, your camera's flat, composed, everything's where it needs to be. If you put them on the rule of thirds or whatever you want to use, that's up to you. But the point of fact is, you do that 100 times a day, you don't really need to do that, do you? You can just go click because you're putting the camera in the same place. You know what length lens you've got on there. You know what's going to be in the frame. You know what's going to be composed. You're going to get the shot. Now then, I had to put it around my neck and hang it down here. So at the end of the day, I walk around with, with my thumb on my uh, shutter release. I know exactly where that camera is pointing. I can sort of predict what's going to happen on the street. And as soon as it starts to come together, I press the shutter. Now, a lot of my photographs, you'll think someone's looking at me. Very rarely are they ever looking at the camera. They may be looking at me and what I'm doing because I've come in close proximity to them. But they hardly ever look down at my camera. They're sort of looking at me. But where my camera's placed, it appears they're looking into the camera lens, but they're actually not. The problem I've got since my stroke is holding this camera here, around my waist and pressing the shutter, I'm missing the shots. I'm getting the shot of what was there, but I'm missing it. I'm not predicting quick enough. I'm not composing quick enough. The photographs that I've taken with this are passable, but my hit rate is, let's call it 20%. Whereas my hit rate before my stroke 
was I could see and compose without holding the camera to my eye and get a shot at 99% roughly, I get them. So I basically found it really, really difficult going back out with the X100, even though I still will use it, but I use it for different things. I then tried to use my X-Pro2 with the, whatever lens, doesn't matter, I've stuck a lens on it for today. But no matter what lens I put on it, the problem with the X-Pro2 is when it hangs around your waist, it drops forward. So then the problem is then is you have to lift it up, hold it in position and try and get it to where you want it. What you've got to remember is for everyone that thinks, well, I just hold the camera to your eye. I don't want to do that, right? We're talking here about what I want to do. I don't want to hold the camera to my eye. It is better with a rangefinder camera because people don't know where you're shooting. When you hold a rangefinder to your eye, they think they're shooting, you're shooting over there anyway when you're actually taking their photograph. Um, rangefinders do work like that. They are a lot better. I shoot like Vivian Mayer, so why don't I have a old road effect? Well, I don't want an old road effect, but in this day and age, a ground glass screen of the old is just like an LCD screen of now. So all I have to do is walk around with this camera, looking down into this LCD screen. Some people I know hold it on their arms like that. There's a lot of difference between holding it underneath your arm trying to be sneaky with not looking because your hit rate's got to be pretty poor. I reckon if you put a camera under your arm without looking and swing it around around about here and hold your finger on the shutter button and shoot burst, you might get something. I don't shoot burst, by the way. I shoot single frames and I shoot one, two or three single frames depending on whether, I, whether I've got the shot or not or I want more. And the reason I don't shoot burst is because that's a hell of a lot of photographs you've got to go and go through afterwards. And I don't want to spend my time editing. I also, if you shoot burst, the chances are, if it doesn't focus or get the focus right on the first one, they're all going to be out of focus. So you can end up with 26 images, 56 images, all out of focus, all badly composed, all crap. And now you've got to go through them all in the editing process and find one that works for you. I can't be asked. So basically I will, Line my camera up. I always shoot with my thumb, by the way, unless I'm shooting with a camera to my eye. I line my camera up. I look in the LCD. I compose, focus, and shoot. With my X100, I zone focus. With my X-Pro2, I use a combination of zone focus and autofocus. And with this new X-T30, I just use autofocus. Put the focus point on the subject, move the camera about, press the shutter halfway down, or use back button focus. Focus, move, shoot, focus, move, shoot, focus, move, shoot, focus, move, shoot. I can see what I'm doing. I'm composing the shot. I'm putting the person where I want them in the frame. I'm getting the background where I want it. I can check the lighting. I can check everything through this nice LCD screen. It's almost the same as using a Rolleiflex camera. It's small, compact, it's easy. It's easy to shoot. I absolutely love it. So I've changed my style and cameras over the years. I've changed from these two, which I still use, to all sorts of cameras I've had, from Nikon D3Ss to Ricohs back in the day, to just, I've had loads of cameras, Nikon FM2s, as I said. Uh, I can't remember what my first camera was, it's Box Brownie, I think. Um, I've had Box cameras, I've had uh, um, Zeiss cameras, I've had all sorts of stuff, I've Pantax Ash Eyes. I could just go on about all the cameras I've had, I'm not gonna bore you with that. I've had loads of Nikon cameras, Nikon D200, by the way, is an amazing sensor. It's just the same sensor. I think Fuji made the sensor, so it's exactly the same sensor that's in the X100. So finding a camera that works for you may work for you today, but it may not work for you tomorrow. The most important thing is to find something that works for you now. I'm 60 years old, I've had a stroke. This works for me now. In 10 years time, will this work for me? I don't know. It could be a bit too heavy. The screen may be a little bit wrong. I might even end up using a smartphone for shooting street photography and people might think, oh, you can't do that. But the stuff for smartphones can do today, imagine what smartphones are gonna do in 10 years time. There are a few things I don't like about some of the camera technology, the same as I don't like about AI. I don't like AI as such because there's a lot of people out there putting themselves on social media telling us they're photographers. They're not, they're using AI and they're just editors. There's nothing wrong with that, it's just be honest about it. And it's the same as some of the camera technology now where you can move um, focus points and everything else afterwards. Fine, that's great. But at the end of the day, I, don't get, I wouldn't get any enjoyment out of that. When I used to do macro photography, my thing was never photo stacking. It was always getting the point of focus like on an eye of an insect and make that really perfectly sharp and have the rest of it all just blending out in the background. I think it looked better. 
There's so many techniques we use these days that I don't think have improved photography. But this works for me today. When I used to do a job, I used to sometimes take my X-Pro2 or, or, or an X-Pro3 as well at the time. So I'd go and shoot with those two together. And my X100 I was, would use as well. As I say, I have now got the X-T30. I'm going to be using this camera from now on. I actually use a Zoom and I've spent a long time using primes and I used to tell people on workshops to use primes. But actually to get this little camera like this and have an 18 to 55 range, flip out the screen and have an 18 to 55 range is absolutely brilliant for me. Saves me mucking about, gets me the shots I need, gets me in close or further back. Brilliant camera, easy to use. I'm not saying go out and buy one. Go and find something that suits you and your needs. I know some photographers these days that have stopped using cameras altogether that just use their phone because it what works for them. And you've got to think about what's the end goal. Are you going to have life-size prints on the size of a billboard going by a GFX or a medium format camera? Are you just going to do stuff on Instagram? Maybe use your phone then, if you know what I mean. It's just like, where are they going to go? What are you going to use them for? Are you going to do an exhibition now in 20 by whatever prints? But if you're going to go and do an exhibition, you want something a little bit better to be able to display your work better. But if you've seen the prints that come out of an iPhone or a smartphone, they're actually quite good. If you've never printed from your phone or your cameras, go and print from your phone and your cameras. You learn so much about it. I'll wrap that up quite a lot. I talk quite fast. I've now got to edit this because there's a few bits I went wrong in and I have to change a few things around. I'm not going to put any photographs at the end of it. Uh, all my work's on Instagram. I'll put the link below. There's some great photographers on Instagram and I'm going to talk about some of my friends that take photographs and what their accounts are in the future. Have a great week and I'll catch you on the next video. Don't like or subscribe because you may not want to bother. See you later guys.